This week on TGC News, Big Blue does a long slide, CMP gets salty, and the U.S. Army gets a sub gun. Birchwood Casey's selection of shooting products is astounding. Whether you're looking for the best targets to zero your gun, or maybe you want to refurbish a forgotten classic, or maybe you just want to slam some steel and have a good time at the range. And don't forget that ear and eye protection. No matter what kind of shooter you are, Birchwood Casey has what you need. And because you watch TGC, they're going to help you out with a discount of 10% off your entire order when you use the code TGC10 over at birchwoodcasey.com. Welcome back to another episode of TGC News, the only gun news show that covers things you actually care about. My name is John Patton. Shout out to everyone in California that tasted freedom for all of five minutes last week. And it's gone. Now, how about we jump into some news? The U.S. Army has selected a new gun, and it might not be what you expect. The challenges that our soldiers are faced with change on a day-to-day -day basis, and the tools they need to accomplish their goals has to change right along with that. So for the first time since World War II, the U.S. Army put a request out for a submachine gun. And boy, did the gun industry deliver. There were 10 main guns in the running. As per the Army's request, these are all chambered in 9mm. In the running, there were some familiar guns like the SIG MPX, CZ Scorpion EVO 3A1, the PTR-9CS, and its cousin, the Zenith Z5P, Z5RS, and Z5K. Then there were a few AR-style guns like the LMT Mars L9, the Colt CM9, and the Quarter Circle 10 CLT and QV5. Then we enter the territory of stuff we rarely see as civilians, outside of video games at least. The BNT MP9, shout out to Rainbow Six Vegas. Now what are you doing? the Beretta PMX, and lastly, the B&T APC-9. I'm sure they considered a whole bunch of other options, but these are the ones that rose to the top. So I suppose your next question is, well, which gun took the prize? Is it SIG? Maybe CZ? Nope. It's a B&T APC-9K. It's a six pound, seven inch barrel, tiny little bastard that has a cyclic rate just under 1,100 rounds per minute, which in machine gun terms is about medium. <laughs> It also has a swappable charging handle, 30 round mags, a three lug suppressor mount, and the rest of the normal stuff that you would expect. I think it's super interesting to see the Army not only select a new 9mm, but also select one that up until a couple years ago had a tiny presence in the US. The contract for two and a half million dollars might mean that we start to see more of BNT in the US over the next few years. What do you guys think? Are you excited about this rise in PDW type guns? If you thought the pistol caliber carbine market swelling was a fad, do you still think that? Is this a result of the civilian market maybe influencing military buying, perhaps? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Next up this week, we have a couple new handguns. Ruger has expanded their line of Security 9 handguns with the new compact version. They'll come with a 3.4 inch barrel, 10 round mags, and weigh in at just under 22 ounces. That puts it right in line with a Glock 26. Pricing on the new Ruger falls in at $379 MSRP, which means you'll likely see it at a dealer for about 350 bucks. You know what I think about Ruger semi-auto handguns, the ones that stand out to me are the tiny ones, the LC9 and the LCP, but in reality, the larger guns have always been really solid value for money, and I wonder why I haven't given them more credit. I don't know. Maybe that's something I need to work on as a person. <laughs> Next up, Smith & Wesson continues to expand on the 2.0 Shield lineup, specifically the Performance Center versions, with the introduction of nine new guns. Yeah, it's a lot. I'll break it down for you. They are all long slide versions of the Shield. We always ask about why companies don't do more compact frame long slide variations, then this kind of fills that role. I say long slide, but it's not really a long slide that we're used to with like a six inch barrel. This is long slide for a compact carry gun. All of the nine new versions will come with four inch barrels in three different calibers and three different variations. So you'll have nine, 40, and 45 versions. And then you'll have a plain four inch barrel gun, a four inch barrel with an optic gun, and finally a version with a ported slide and barrel and an optic. 
The optics are included here, which is pretty cool, and that's likely a result of American Outdoor Brands, the parent company of Smith & Wesson, also acquiring Crimson Trace back in 2016. Pricing on the plain slide version is $532. The optic ready with plain slide is $826, and the ported slide and barrel with the optic is $854. Being that these are all performance center versions, I'm confident in saying that they'll be fantastic guns, and the fact that the Optic Ready models actually come with an optic is pretty rad as far as I'm concerned. I think I'm gonna see if I can get a hold of one of those things for Ben to review and see if it actually does hold up and if it's actually any good. It's time once again for rapid fire news. The Civilian Marksmanship Program, or CMP, is a group in charge of handling surplus 1911s coming into the country that are marked for sale to civilians, and they're pissed. Why? Because people are putting their name in for the guns. There was like a huge rush of this, we covered this before, then immediately listing those guns for sale on sites like Gunbroker and other auction sites to try and turn a profit. The CMP is only selling a limited amount of guns, and that sort of thing seems to hurt the intent of the program. They even posted a notice on their website about it, stating, It has been brought to our attention that some customers are receiving their 1911 and posting on Gunbroker and other such sites for resale. This was not the intention of the program. If you are found to be reselling these pistols, you will be banned from purchasing from the CMP for an indefinite period. We are aware of the issue and we will handle. Please, no phone calls or emails concerning the situation. Thank you. I understand why they're upset. It definitely isn't the point of the program, but I also think it's kind of un-American to try and control what people do with their personal property that they purchased legally. Next in rapid fire news, a company called Matador Arms has released something called the Mag X. What is it? Well, it's a magazine adapter for an AR-15 that allows you to use P320 magazines. We've seen this a ton for Glock mags, it's been around forever, and it's kind of neat to see this available now for 320 mags. The only downside here is the price. When I saw the pricing, I'm looking at this, kind of doing my research here, and I go, holy crap, that is a really high price. It's 120 bucks right now. But then I compared it to other similar products, and maybe I was the disconnect there. That seems to be what they cost. Why you would go with this over a dedicated pistol mag lower is kind of beyond me at this point with how many options we have that are great. But as I always say, options are a good thing. And last but not least, the production company that brought you such gems as Treetop Cat Rescue, Topless Prophet, and The Real Exorcist is now casting for a show tentatively called Top Sniper. They are seeking accomplished long-range shooters to host and participate in the show. And to be fair, they have some experience doing this. They're also the company that produced one of the best shooting shows ever on television called Top Shot. Yeah, you guys remember that show? It was awesome. We will put a link in the description for those of you that want to get involved in that. It's pretty cool. Just go check it out. Neomag offers a slick solution to discreetly carrying a spare magazine securely in your pocket. Available in small, medium, and large to hold anything from 380 to 10 mil. Also now available are the extended clip versions, which allow you to carry deeper in your pocket or carry your spare mag with an extension. Utilizing strong neodymium magnets, a steel backer, and titanium clips, these things are built to last. To get 10% off your entire order over at theneomag.com, use the code TGC10. It's time once again for Friendly Fire, the segment where I answer your questions from all over the interwebs. This week, our questions are coming from the Gun Collective's Facebook page. I'm in a little bit of a snarky mood, so let's do this. What are you gonna do? I thought I'd get your theories, mock them, then embrace my own. First up, James Larson says, when will the NFA be repealed? Well, James, the truth is that it's not going to happen in our lifetime. Of all of the issues facing politicians, this is so far down on the list of priorities, it's just not gonna happen. It's fun to say, repeal the NFA, and I love the sentiment, and it makes sense, but I just don't think it's gonna happen. Scott Joyce says, in Texas, over 26 inches, VFG legal or no, you can't find an answer. Hi, Scott, let me preface this by saying I am not a lawyer and this is in no way legal advice. Stop it. Just get an angled foregrip. 
I see this question come up all the time. And the reality is the ATF has never given some kind of direction as, hey, your AR pistol is over a certain length. It's totally fine to use a vertical grip. Just use an angled grip. Avoid the situation entirely. Steve Schultz is asking about why more companies aren't remaking old guns from, you know, World War I and World War II. Well, there are a couple issues there. Number one is patent and ownership of the original guns. And then there's the concern of the actual market size. They have to make money to justify doing this, right? I bet that market is probably smaller than you think. I mean, I would buy a couple of the ideas and a couple of the old school guns, but does that make up for the cost of R&D and rebuilding and modernizing and tooling and all this stuff? I'm not so sure. Casey Fuller wants to know if there are any significant organizations he can trust to defend his rights. The short answer, yes. Second Amendment Foundation, Firearms Policy Coalition, and GOA. The more complex answer is stop pretending like these groups are going to fix everything for you. So many of us fall into that trap of, well, I pay them money, so they should be protecting my rights. Wrong answer, Chucko. We are losing ground every day all over the country, and that is because we are not as active as we need to be in fighting for our own rights. Get off your rear ends and go do something. And rounding us out, Michael Marchmont wants to know how many mags got shipped into California during the temporary freedom. I don't know if there's any way to really track it, but I guarantee it was a butt ton. <laughs> My friendly fire question to you guys this week. If all ammo costs exactly the same amount, no matter what caliber, bullet weight, whatever, all of it costs exactly the same amount, what are the top three guns that you would buy? That's going to be a fun one. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. And hey, if you want your question answered right here on the show, send it to me over on theguncollective.com. And that's it for this week's show, guys. If you disliked it, hit that button. If you liked it, hit like, hit subscribe. Consider supporting us via the links in the video description. There's an Amazon affiliate store as well as a link to purchase shirts and stuff like that. Links to find us on social media, blah, blah, blah. Links, 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 links. As always, thank you all for watching. We'll see you soon. Yep, it's over, but don't worry. You can click on the video up top to watch last week's show, and the one below that is the one YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. Check them out and let me know what you think.